Welcome to our Suffolk Libraries Day Online Book Festival. I'm Lisa, your host, the Reader Development Librarian for Suffolk Libraries. And as a charity, our annual fundraising day, Suffolk Libraries Day, is vitally important to us. And we are so grateful for all your support and donations. Thank you all. To launch our festival, I am delighted to welcome one of my favourite authors, Sarah Vaughan. Welcome, Sarah, and thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's lovely to be back. It's fabulous. And you've written, you've done it again. Of course yeah. you have. Your latest book, Reputation, is uh, just utterly gripping and thrilling. And obviously it's fiction, yet part of the inspiration for this book is eerily the world we live in. And I believe there's an MP in your constituency who had an experience that was part of the inspiration for your story. Yeah, that's right. So um, I actually, it was a different MP. First of all, I was reading an interview in The Times, a feature with this female MP in which she described having um, nine locks on her front door and a panic alarm by her bed. And actually she has a panic room in a constituency as well. And at the same time, um, the Tory MP Anna Subri was getting masses and masses of abuse online for her anti-Brexit stance. Um, Luciano Berger was getting masses of anti-Semitic abuse and the, my then MP Heidi Allen in South Cambridgeshire um, was, she'd actually had to go to court and a guy had gone to was going to prison uh, or, or had, had gone to prison and someone in my village she had a restraining order against him because of stuff they put online that was sort of threatening um, and I just thought my goodness what must it be like to exist when you're experiencing that level of threat I should say reputations about a female MP who, who stands trial for murder um, when a tabloid journalist with whom she's become entangled is, is found in her home but it's really about the difficulty women experience navigating their way through public life and and there are themes like harassment and online abuse and revenge porn so that's where all of that comes in so yes there was a one of the one of the women who I was inspired by was my MP who subsequently didn't stand at the 2019 election because she she just experienced so much and she, I think she just thought what am I doing why am I putting myself through this I really feel like with your book Sarah you're you've got this extraordinary knack of getting to the heart of issues that are affecting us you've done it in all your books and you, you brilliantly do it in reputation and um Pat has asked about do you ever feel pulled in by social media because obviously you're a public figure as an author you know how do you feel about social media oh I feel I don't know I'm a public figure but I I think it's really problematic I mean I on the one hand, Twitter has been great for contact. You know, I think if I, I used to be a journalist before, up until I was about 40, now 49, I was a journalist. And, you know, if Twitter had, if I'd known how to use Twitter then, it would have been a great resource. It's been a fantastic way to meet other writers and to meet contacts who, who have been really helpful for my story. So when I've talked to, um, uh, well, some politicians, but also um, lawyers, particularly with anatomy, Twitter was a great way of sort of building contacts like that. But I also think it's potentially really dangerous and uh, what I was exploring with this is that um, you know that the anonymity of social media mm -hmm. and the accessibility means that anybody can tweet anybody and if you're anonymous you it's kind of like you can be extra vicious it's kind of like the normal norms of behavior whereby if you said something horrible to somebody's face you would hopefully row back you would curb what you were saying because you would see the impact it was having but it's as if on a screen these so-called keyboard warriors who are sort of bashing out insults um sorry my dogs just joined me for some reason oh, bless. Um, uh uh they don't see a reaction you know they're just firing it off into the ether and so they forget that there's an individual at the end of it and another thread that I had in the book um, involves social media and teenagers there's mm -hmm. my MPM a Webster has a 14 year old daughter and she is being bullied online by her friend frenemies you know so-called friends who've then turned on her and are using things like Instagram and Snapchat to um, you know make her life very very difficult um, and so I was really I think we are going to look back and we're going to think my goodness as soon as our kids as soon as we gave them a smartphone you know we're allowing anybody to 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 really basically you know to them really isn't it they get yeah, access to, to you them in a you know in their bedroom and in fact really, really month, years ago i'm just gonna put the dog out sorry you go that way go that way oh, sorry <laughs> um i don't know why i had her um we're, we're going to um 
you know, we're going to think, gosh, we let our we let our children be exposed to that without really sufficient regulations. You know, we're going to look back at how people were able to get to people in a supposedly safe environment. You're in your bedroom, you know, you, you perhaps you're, I mean, my kids aren't allowed their phones in their bedrooms, but you know, perhaps you're going to bed and you check online and somebody sent you a really nasty message mm -hmm. you know, on Instagram or a DM, or, you know, said something about you that you've seen. And, um, you know, there you are in your safest place and yet you've, something really nasty has come through to you through, through you know, a gadget like this. Um, so I wanted to explore the sort of harm that social media can cause for teenagers as well as for public figures. And I really, when you mentioned there, uh, Flora, Emma's daughter, I, I really love that you had that in the book. You had those two threads of what they were experiencing as women um, in different environments. Obviously, Emma's an MP, Flora's a school kid, but how social media is affecting them. And obviously, you, you said a moment ago about um, the kind of abuse that um, pop, like um, MPs, for example, like in your book, can get online. But some of the beginning of the book, it's quite shocking as to the kind of precautions they have to take when they meet constituents in person because they are literally putting themselves out there and regardless of your politics or, or what you, you believe or think your local MP is doing, um, they're putting themselves at risk every time. And obviously we saw that last year. Um, and, you know, there's, there's been a couple of occasions now mm. where that's happening, sadly, in this country. And it's extraordinarily brave. And I, I, you obviously explored that as well in the book, that their own person is at risk as well. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I should make clear that I... I finished reputation and it was in a sort of proof form. So it was yeah. out looking like this. Um, in I think, you know, in the September or whatever, it would have been sent out as PDFs before that. And then Sir David Amos was stabbed by um somebody in his constituency surgery, and it was all bound and done. I wasn't I wasn't trying to exploit a situation, but obviously I was very aware I allude to and a female MP being killed, but I don't use the word Joe Cox, so I didn't want to be exploitative. But obviously, you know, that very much hung over this as I was writing it. And when I was talking to MP, because I've talked to various MPs to do my research um, and to staff in their, their offices about the precautions, and this was this was back in the summer of 2019, it was before the pandemic started, it was when I was starting to research the book, way before Sir David Amos, obviously. Mm. And I talked to, you know, I was really shocked that, you know, there was no standard security that they all got. And it, it really sort of depended up to the individual MP how much security they wanted their staff to help introduce. And, you know, one ran me through the things that they do before they have a constituency surgery. And it was things like you put a chair, you put a table in front of yourself, you check that you've got an escape route. So, you know, if you're in a school, you're gonna have a fire exit in your car by it in case you need to run out. You're gonna have a desk in front of you and the constituent. You're gonna have a chair that can be kicked over. And on the desk, you're gonna have two bottles of water, not to drink, but in case someone throws acid, you've got two 1.5 litres bottles of water, and then you can throw it over you in case they throw acid at you. And they, you know, try and do bag checks, although some people are gonna try and look and see if somebody's looking a bit shifty, you know, and rummaging in a bag, and perhaps looking a bit suspicious, you're gonna be suspicious of them. And, you know, th these are the staff, people who could earn just, I think I say in the book, or I do say mm -hmm. in the book, they could earn just as much money, or the same salary, and it's not a masses of money at all, if they were, you know, an office manager for a, I don't know, a estate agents or, you know, solicitors or any other business, you know, but they, but they experience um, constituents ringing up, you know, being abusive down the phone, and the risk that, you know, when they open a package, you know, they could have that sounds extreme, but they could have dog poo through, poo through the letterbox yeah. or they could have something nasty in the letter. I mean, some of these MPs were getting letters, you know, claiming that they were sending rice in um, or, you know, no Novichok through the post. You know, this was after the Salisbury poisonings and things, you know, just from sort of people who didn't like them were sending nasty letters threatening that there was Novichok that was being sent and things like this. You know, so there was a level of of uh, jeopardy and a level of threat that, that these, you know, perfectly normal people working in mm. as staff in the office, admin, staff, secretary, receptionist, you know, office manager, are having to deal with because they're working for an MP. I just thought it was absolutely incredible. And I think that government, the Parliament is now looking at 
improving security measures. But when David Amos was killed, there were MPs saying, well, you know, we don't want security bouncers on the door and we don't want yeah. police presence. And one MP I spoke to said, um, well, you know, you don't want to cry wolf. Um, and you're really aware that the police have got really limited resources. So if I'm, if every time I'm having constituency surgery, I wouldn't dream of having police there because there are so many other things they could be doing. You know, they could be going to victims of domestic violence or, you know, burglaries or things like that, you know. So it's a really tricky balance for them. I thought it was fascinating and it was something I really wanted to, I'm really glad that's come across in the book because I thought mm. it was really important to expose that. And it's it was it was quite shocking because um, I'd not personally really thought about it. Well, we but these, do they? No, like what they what they go through, our MPs, and they're there to serve. You know, as I said, regardless of what party or what their opinions are, they, they must have a call a calling to serve yeah. to some extent. Otherwise, why would they subject themselves to this potential risk? And obviously, we talked we sort of talked a lot about this new book. Are you happy to do a reading for the audience, Sarah? Yeah, I always, I always feel a bit nervous doing this, but it probably gives you quite a good idea of Emma. So, so um, obviously you can't do it very far in because that gives away too much. But Emma Webster is 44. She is, um, she was a teacher um, and she became an MP at about 40. She thought that she, so she's only been an MP for four years and she thought that she, it would take a few goes. She thought it might be like on her third election. So it would be about nine years before she actually became it. And that was kind of the unofficial deal that she kind of um, meted out with her now ex-husband. And, you know, it's a marginal seat and, and politics as we, as we know, as we know from the 2019 election, you know, um, can be very changeable. And so she gets elected and she's surprised. And within six months of being elected, her marriage has fallen apart and her husband has now married an ex friend of hers. So there's a woman called Caroline, who's this sort of second Mrs. Webster, but Emma has a 14 year old daughter and in the week she stays with um, her husband, her ex-husband and at the weekend, she's kind of with Emma. Um, and Emma is just starting to sort of make a name for herself because she uh, she's generally she's she went into politics because she um, she was concerned about child poverty really you know the, the kids she was teaching uh, some of them were falling through the gaps and she was aware some were going to food banks and weren't wearing coats in the winter so she so she went generally for reasons like that but she also is really concerned about sort of feminist issues and she a bit later on she um after this chapter um she starts to campaign um for for better penalties for revenge porn that's the kind of sort of campaign but she she sort of puts her head above the parapet by being by mentioning that in this interview in this chapter and in this chapter she has been um She's been interviewed by the Guardian Weekend. I know that in 2021, when this is set, the Guardian Weekend no longer existed. But I thought she'd be more likely to want to do that than than doing it for the Times. But she's been she's been put on the cover of a glossy magazine in a Saturday supplement of a Saturday supplement, and um, it's really about the image that's portrayed of her and how she feels about that. I'll stop rambling and try and read a bit quicker. Sorry. No, you're perfect. Uh, okay. Looking back, it was the interview in the Guardian weekend that started everything, or rather the fact I was on the cover. Exquisitely photographed, I more, looked more like an Oscar-nominated actress than a Labour MP. It was hard not to be seduced by it all. The designer trousers suit elongated my legs, as did the suede heels, something I resisted at first because I always wore flats, pristine Stansmiths or brogues if I felt the need to appear more formal. But heels connoted power, according to the stylist. And it was a trope I chose to accept in that one reckless moment, the first of several. In any case, I hope the heels were balanced out by the message on the crisp white t-shirt, well-behaved women seldom make history. I'd seen no reason not to scream a sentiment from the rooftops. It was something I vehemently believed. Only, when I saw myself on the front cover with that defiant slash of red lipstick, my armour against a hostile world, and my thick bob blow-dried into a dark halo, I hardly recognised myself. I'd morphed into someone else entirely. Sex and power, that was the not so subtle subtext of that photo. Sex, power, an unequivocal ambition. Even before the publication, I felt uneasy. Crikey, I said, when Dan, the photographer, showed me a couple of images through the preview screen on the back of his camera. They were tiny, six centimetres by four, and yet they were resting. The back of the back of my neck prickled. I look pretty formidable, I said. You look strong, Esther Enfield, the paper's newly appointed political editor reassured me. 
strong and determined. It fits the interview. It illustrates what you were saying imperfectly. You didn't pussyfoot around with your message and neither does this. I don't know, can I see it again? I leant across against um, Dan, suddenly conscious of his physicality. The fact he towered over me was long limbed and energetic, like a teenager oozing testosterone, though he must have been in his early thirties. His breath smelled of artisan coffee. You look great, he was brisk. I sensed his eagerness to get on. I just look a bit hard. I lingered on a shot of me in a butter soft black leather jacket, the, coll the collar framing my unsmiling face. He'd captured a side of me I didn't like to acknowledge. So really as ruthless as he made me appear. Esther shrugged, which made me feel foolish. In her mid-forties like me, she knew what she was talking about and had sound instincts. I was a good contact. Besides, this was the Guardian, not the Daily Mail. We won't stitch you up, I promise. She seemed to read my mind and then she gave me a proper warm smile. And so, because this is my first national newspaper feature, because I didn't want to look weak, because I was flattered, I suppose, that the Guardian thought me sufficiently interesting to put on their magazine's front cover, I let myself be swayed by her arguments. I let myself believe what I wanted to believe. Besides, as Esther said, the photo would be balanced by what was inside, a sharp attack on the government's austerity measures, apparent in my Portsmouth South constituency, with the need for food banks have proliferated in the last couple of years, a critique of my party leader, Harry Godwin, as ineffective and prone to self-indulgence, and details of my private member's bill calling for anonymity for victims of revenge porn, the reason I'd agreed to this piece. It was a serious interview worth doing, despite knowing it would irritate more established colleagues, and the photos would be seen through this lens. It's fantastic shot, said Dan, stubbled and art artfully dishevelled. Later, I wondered if this was the reason I caved in so easily. This simple flattery from a younger man who coaxed me being into photograph like this. Just a couple more heads up, that's it. It's perfect, sweet. Was I sublimely so desperate for male ad admiration, a 44 so conscious of becoming sexually invisible that, despite everything I stood for, I let myself be flattered by and played up to his uncompromisingly male gaze. Okay, let's go for it, I told Esther. As you say, no point pussyfooting around. Absolutely. Honestly, the pics are arresting. And it's precisely because of this, your colleagues will have to listen to what you say. And so I quashed my critical inner voice, the one that used the waspish tones of my late grandmother, with a smashing of my ex-husband David's caution, and that always gathered in volume and intensity until I felt like shaking my head to be rid of it. Pride comes before fall. Of course, later I would regret this, bitterly, deeply, because that cover shot would be used repeatedly, the stock image that would accompany every Emma Webster story from that moment on. It would be the picture used when I was arrested, when I was charged, when the trial began. And this would rankle because far from capturing the true me, it was a brittle, knowing version, red lips slightly parted in a way that couldn't fail to seem distinctly sexual, gaze defiant, a clear, almost brazen challenge in what the article would describe as my limpid, dark eyes. A far cry from who, how I thought of myself or who I'd ever been, an A-level history teacher at South Hampshire College, Flora's mum, or a Labour backbencher who tried so very hard to serve her constituency while campaigning on feminist issues more generally. A, paper paint, a picture paints a thousand words, and yet this one reduced me to nothing more than a glamorous mugshot. My challenge to the camera, not so different from the insolent expression captured in every custody photo snapped by the police. Nor later to better bastardes carbon noradum. Don't let the bastards get you down. I had an old t-shirt with that message. Perhaps I should have suggested the, the stylist that I wear it. It would have been incendiary, of course. A clear two fingers to the trolls, the media, the critics in my own party let alone my political opponents, who I suspected were poised even then to see me stumble. Had I known what had happened, I might have shrugged it straight on. Sorry, it's stumbly at the end. Absolutely, I went a bit goosebumpy at one point there. I was also having read, having read the book oh. and when you said about her being arrested. And one, one of the things I, I was thinking when I was reading the book, and obviously the world, her, her life kind of explodes after this article that she does. And she's you know com campaigning for some really important things. And one of the things that I kept thinking is, I wonder how it would have been if he, she'd been a man. Oh, if I think she, it wouldn't have had a novel, would we? We wouldn't have a novel, I don't think. Exactly, you know, and, and that's something that's also like that underbred of your book that a lot of what's happening to her is because she's a, a strong, you know, outspoken, it's scandalous woman who's campaigning for, you know, as you say, like to be better, more penalties for things like revenge porn because of what happened to, I mean, it was Amy, one of her um, constituents um, who ended up killing herself because of something that happened. And that's like quite early on in mm. the book. And for her to go and do all of this is so important. And yet, if she'd been a man, would, you know, as you say, there wouldn't have been a book. 
She'd never have got it. I think I must get a statistic because I keep being asked about this, but um, I think the parliamentary authorities have kind of assessed um, emails that come through to MPs that are, anything that's abusive, if it's an email, they, it's forwarded to sort of, you know, an office. Um, and um, because obviously it's sort of come through the parliamentary email system addresses. And they've done some sort of um, analysis of who's receiving these. And it's disproportionately, I mean, I can't remember the statistic, but it's something like 70 or 80% or whatever. It's women who are getting them. And it's women of colour as well. So I think Diane Abbott gets far more than anybody else. Um, but yes, although Sir David Emmis was, you know, obviously male, because the person who was, and, and that was, I mean, the trial hasn't happened, but it's believed to be terror related, isn't it? I think that. But in general, the, 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 the extreme abuse seems to be for, for female MPs. And I have to say, anybody who's sort of quite sort of good with the media, good at that, because, and then they're very visible, you know, attractive, mm -hmm. vivacious. So Heidi Allen, my MP, there's an MP called Rosie Duffield, who has, who's attracting masses of abuse at the moment, has talked about, you know, maybe leaving Labour Party because of it. Um, Anna Subri got masses of abuse, Luciana Berger, you know, it's as if any media friendly woman who, who just has something to say is a, is a sort of red rag really. And in fact, there was another interview I read about three weeks ago in, in the Times with Tony Blair and Andrew Billen interview. And, and Tony Blair actually said, I can't, you know, if I was a woman, I wouldn't be going, you know, I, or I he didn't quite say if I was a woman, but, you know, I can't, you know, I can imagine that, you know, I can't see why female MPs would want to go into it at the moment. I think it's absolutely vicious. Yeah. I mean, I would say in general, um, it, I do think it's harder in public life as a woman than a man anyway. I mean, just, just look at newsreaders. Or well, somebody made a comment this morning, I did an interview with um, Irish Radio, and they said, oh, well, Emma Webster looks fantastic, but, you know, if she was the Prime Minister, she wouldn't even have to brush her hair, would she? <laughs> And I thought, no, you know, if you had a female MP standing up with hair all mussed up and a big tummy and, a, you know, a, and not caring how shambolic his suit looked, she would be knocked right down. Like you only have to look at yeah. celebrities as well. If you look at, you know, I don't know. I don't I have been buying magazines because my book's been reviewed in it. So, you know, these Love Island celebrities, they're, mu you know, a front cover of, you know, something like Heat or something is much more harsh to a. Yeah. to a female celebrity you know if she's got dimples or you know put on weight or doesn't look as good in her bikini much more harsh than i shouldn't be lying heat magazine i don't know if that does it but you know then then with male celebrities it's it's generally a thing with the press and when you were saying um there was i think it was Theresa may and nicola sturgeon where there was a front page where it was like legs it or something and, and and it was about their yeah. legs and yeah. the you know that was our prime minister and um as you just said they it's, it would be extraordinarily unusual for the british press to do something like that with a male mp or a Boris male prime minister are, i don't know what his legs are like but i don't think they're on the front <laughs> that <laughs> could be somebody, a whole somebody, separate story <laughs> someone did a did a um uh, a lovely review of reputation today and she and she said actually that there was a there was a piece on the downing street catwalk which i need to look up you know i don't know if that's sort of liz truss and you know pretty patel and you know i must look up what that story is but you know there's been lots of pieces they've had liz truss who you know whatever you think of her she's i mean maybe she plays up to it she obviously likes being photographed but um I think she was in the Times as well, sort of, you know, very glammed up in lots of sharp suits. And Laura Koonsberg, they've done it with her as well. Yeah. I mean, it, it, they, we are, they are packaged. And, and very way. much like what, as women, when, you know, they take on these roles that they have to deal with. You know, it's, it's as you say, it's almost like it's part of the parcel. There's no <laughs> avoiding it. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to Ali has said that um, the book, it's a really apt and timely theme, Sarah, which is so true. I think you've got an extraordinary knack of that, of oh. almost writing it before it becomes, as you say, like this is before that, what happened with David Amos, you know, Anatomy of a Scandal was before Me Too movement. And yeah. it just, it's extraordinary. But um, Ali has asked, with the research that you've done, have you ever been asked to participate in any sort of government or local authority discussions on what could be done? <laughs> I think that would be amazing, actually. Well, I haven't. That, that, I'm not sure. You should. I, think, I think the MPs, Ali, who, who are experiencing this probably um are the people who should be asked about it you know because i as, as i say it seemed to me absolute 
madness that you know they they, they are put in these these situations without any, with very minimal security measures that they have to kind of at the time you know I don't I think they were um you know they're not mandatory they're just you know if you want to do them and another example one of the MPs I spoke to she was having to move um and I put a bit of this in the book uh she's having to move offices because she was in a grade two listed building it's Heidi Allen um and they weren't they couldn't put an answer phone on the front door or a you know they weren't allowed to because it was a great you know beautiful lovely grade two listed building so you can't put like a separate door and an entry phone because that would not be good for the listed building <laughs> so she had to move and another MP a male MP I spoke to had a beautiful Georgian home constituency home and he said you know again you know the it, it wasn't really allowed to put these security measures, these extra bolts on the windows because they were sash windows or whatever. I mean, come on, guys, you know, <laughs> let's get our priorities right here. Um, but I think sometimes it's if you're, I don't mean that specifically to the MPs, I mean more the sort of yeah. you know local authorities. You know, I live in an old house. I was, I'm really for preserving old architecture, but not the expense of people's safety. And I think sometimes it's it's only when you're an outsider looking in, you know, that that you can flag so as a journalist in the past and now writing about sort of topical issues that you can flag up how bonkers some of these ideas are because I think when you're in the enmeshed in that situation when you're living in that world and you're doing you know 14 16 hour days you take it as read and there's a bit later in the book you know where she says when did I when did I when did I accept that this is normal and it's not it's, normal you know it's, it's not amazing normal. how much that happens it becomes a new normal really yeah. Of their lives that they have to deal with this well i think on a on a general level i think we've all got used to having phones in our pockets and you know checking you know checking it too many times a day you know my husband doesn't do it as much as me at all and i say why are you checking your phone it's just it's sort of it's, it's almost like a tick you know because oh, somebody might have tweeted about my book <laughs> well, it's, that's not normal <laughs> well you you've said a few times you mentioned about obviously you were a journalist before you became a writer now i think going back to where this all began your 40th birthday I believed <laughs> there was a moment where you were like right I'm writing a novel like, like sorry you carry on I interrupted no I was gonna say like how did was that something that was always there when you got to a point where you were like do you know what I'm doing this well I I, I mean I didn't really want to stop being a journalist but I I um, we moved up to East Anglia for my husband's job got a job up, up here and I was pregnant with our second baby and I had a back back really bad back complication I couldn't walk uh from 19 weeks pregnant and when my second child was 11 months I still was in really acute pain and I went to see a pain consultant who's who did me an MRI scan and she said you know you're absolutely ridiculous if you think that you're going to commute up to London with two small children and a husband who's working all the time and not around you're going to you're not going to be able to manage it within a week you're going to be flat on your back and actually um it kind of, sorry, this is a, a long story, but it kind of gave me the permission to take voluntary redundancy from The Guardian because um, I just couldn't do the childcare struggle. Mm -hmm. I mean, my the cost of childcare and the train up to London would have eaten up much more than my salary. You know, it, it's that sort of bind that I think lots of us find ourselves in. Um, but it gave me permission to sort of stay at home with my kids and to freelance. But I discovered that I was hopeless at freelancing because I'd, I'd had a really buzzy job. You know, I was... I was in the lobby and I and then I was a health correspondent and I'd always been sort of at the centre of stories I was used to writing you know I wrote splashes I, on a Sunday I'd often write five or six stories for the paper if I was doing politics I'd always be writing page leads I was you know I've seen as quite good and suddenly to be sending story ideas and people to be saying oh, I don't think that's a feature I mean to be thinking I know that's a feature but news has changed you know features mm. have changed this thing called the internet's come along this is 2010 uh and so you can get lots of stuff for free you can get bloggers who are doing it for free mm. i'm a bit more expensive because you've got to pay me nuj rates you know all these issues came into it so in 2012 september 2012 i was 40 and i had had this idea because i wasn't writing news i'd suddenly I'd always wanted to write a book, but I didn't think I had anything important to say. Um, and I suddenly had this idea, uh, which wasn't a thriller. Um, and I started working on it and I got a bit drunk in front of some girlfriends and a bit Prosecco. And they said, oh, what are you going to do in your 40th year? And I said, oh, I'm going to write a novel and I'm going to get it published. Um, and that's lovely, awesome. The lovely thing is that because I kind of said it, I was then a bit accountable and I kind of 
had a deal with my husband who kind of wanted me to go and earn some money basically and not you know and he bless him he said look why don't we give it a year and I had still had some voluntary redundancy money and I've been really 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 careful um with it and uh he said you know you're gonna need to get a proper job if this doesn't work out after a year and uh and so I sort of set myself but he said you need to try and get an agent so I sort of wrote off to somebody and because I'd sort of said it drunkenly at this party I then had one of the mum in particular at the school gate every day she'd say how many words have you written today and you know how's the book going and so I couldn't no pressure of, pressure and I wrote to this agent who became my oh, I don't I'd only written 28,000 words. I didn't know because I wasn't on Twitter, didn't know anything about publishing. I didn't know you're meant to complete your book and you're meant to edit it and make it really pristine before you send your three chapters off to agents. So I'd written uh, 28,000 words. I said I'd written 30. And I wrote this, this really ballsy letter, really unlike me, because my confidence wasn't great at the time, saying, uh, still not great, saying, um, I know exactly what I'm doing and I, I'm a former journalist, so I write to a deadline, a word count every day and I meet deadlines and, you know, this is all going swimmingly and exactly what's happening. And by the time she'd, three months later, by the time she picked it off her slush pile, those three chapters, I'd written about 66,000 words. So she said, why don't you really work on what you've got and then send it to me? And then she worked, that was in the January 2013, and then she worked with me on it for various drafts. And I effectively had a sort of personal MA going on and then we sold it in a preempt in September uh, no the October so it was 13 months 13 months after my 40th birthday and we sold it so it was brilliant so so the plan paid off but I still can't believe that happened but yeah so a very long story I'd always wanted to I'd always wanted to write books I never I can remember Zadie Smith getting a book deal I think she's a couple of years younger than me at like 23 or something she got it and I just remember straight out of Cambridge I just remember being utterly bemused that a young woman could get a book deal. I mean, I just had never heard of that, you know. Um, but I, yeah, I just didn't have the confidence. And I also didn't have, I think, the creative headspace. I kind of needed to stop writing news to let my imagination roam. And it was only when I was at home with my kids, a bit bored, but doing lots of things with them, that I started to think about stories. Yeah, so I feel very lucky to have had two careers. Sorry for the long answer. It was absolutely awesome and I think it's wonderful because I've said at the beginning you are one of my favourite authors I think your books are phenomenal and um, Emma has asked in the audience about something and it's something that I've honestly I have an alert on my calendar for the 15th Ooh. of April <laughs> now what could that possibly mean Sarah what's Ooh. happening and um, I'm going to get rid of the questions. So on the 15th of April, I know the terminology anatomy of scandal is dropping. <laughs> and I just discovered it's going to be in 190 countries, which completely blows my mind. <laughs> That's phenomenal. And I'm, I'm just going to put the book up. So anatomy of a scandal is um, also in Westminster story. Um, and as I mentioned before, it was before things like um, Me Too phenomena, things like that, you know, and yeah, it's extraordinarily apt again. And Emma has asked, you, you can't wait for it. And neither can Peter. I don't know if they've got an alert on their calendar um, to go. And it's Easter Friday. So I'm there with chocolate. Yeah. yeah watching Netflix eggs. all day. Easter eggs, <laughs> um, I reckon. Sarah's asked, have you previewed any of it? And I believe you've watched the first four episodes. I've now watched all six episodes. Oh, have you? Oh my God, <gasps> no. that's so exciting. Um, but I've um, I've watched what they call rough cuts, so they're not completely finished, um, but pretty good. And they've got music on them and everything. And uh, yeah, they're, it's, I think they're brilliant. So they, um, they made me cry. Michelle Dockery made me cry. I love her. She's, yeah. a, I, I just thought she's going to be great as Kate. Like, have you seen the totally pictures? Look, wait a second, I'm gonna, look. These, these are in my study, inspiring me. There she is, as Kate, can you see? Oh, that's fantastic. And here's Rupert being in the dock. <laughs> so he's James Whitehouse in the dock. Um, the others I printed out, I'm not sure if I can share them yet, they're me on set. Anyway, I'll, uh, I think I have to share those close to the time. And um, yeah, so it's... Um, I think it's excellent. I think it's, it's, um, I feel they've been, they've really stuck to, when you sell your rights, you, you kind of sell away the creative control. That's kind of the deal. They're giving you the money and they're allowed to alter things. And they, they have a bit, but I would say, I think they've been really faithful 
to the tone of the book and really they've kept it really nuanced. I think they've actually improved it. Uh, I think they've made James more three dimensional. So they've improved it. Um, and um, I had, I was able to give, um, I'm an executive producer, uh, which I think can be a, just a, like a vanity thing, like an extra label on, um, on, you know, the credits, um, but I don't want to gesticulate so much. And, um, but I felt they really involved me. So they let me look at, I looked at, I think five different drafts of the scripts um, and gave notes on them. And I felt they really listened to everything I said, basically. And I was really obsessed. They had to get the legal stuff right mm -hmm. and they had to get the politics right. So I sort of brought in people who would help with that or check things out with political contacts and things. And I also think I was probably quite useful because the script writers who were amazing, so David E. Kelly, who did Big Little Lies, he's married to Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> and he, um, and back in the day, he wrote Ali McBeal, he did Law at Boston. So he's kind of knows about Amer the American legal system. Um, Melissa James Gibson, who wrote House of Cards. Um, but but, oh, you've got an extraordinary people behind the amazing. series. Amazing but they're both Americans so obviously it's a very English mm. and, and they chose which I'm so well in fact I had various offers actually and and some of the other offers wanted to set it in like an Ivy League uni and what one of the reasons that I love the people who bought it so much I mean largely I did because they they're very I knew I'd get quite a feminist telling of it they put lots of women in front of the camera and behind the camera um, but also they were really emphatic that it was going to be English and I think there's something about the I mean entitlement is something you could find in all cultures but I mm. think this is really about anatomy uh, the scandal not of, of the rape but of entitlement and I think that is so entrenched in our political system now that it really makes sense for it to be filmed in the UK and it looks I, th I guess they're really hoping that people who like the crown will really like this because I mean I, I have no idea what they've spent on it but the the setting the locations that they use are just stunning you know they, they spent time in Oxford in Winchester masses in central London in Manchester um creating the house of parliament and the bailey they filmed in the old bailey and then they filmed um uh, this set at Shepperton where they they made a court to the old bailey a little bit smaller and they filmed lots there and 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 the house and, and they've kind of it looks um so that they the same producer and obviously david e. kelly made big little eyes and something called the undoing i don't know if you've seen that as well um which is a uh from a book and had um hugh grant and michelle and uh, michelle and um, nicole Crick kidman in and that and big little eyes are known for looking really beautiful you know really sumptuous and and you know lovely palette of clothing and you know just just the cinematography being really beautiful um and it just looks beautiful but more importantly um i think it's going to be really thought-provoking and sienna yes. miller sienna miller's um performance is just phenom phenomenal i think you know i think she's just because um, she's such an important character as well yeah and how and she reacts and, to yeah. james and yeah and she's and the, i mean i think all three of them are in, I think actually James might have been in one more scene then, but you know, it, it's very evenly, Sienna's the, 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 the top name I think on it, on the billing, but I think they're, they're very, very evenly spaced out their scenes and that, you know, very much three leads. And then um, Naomi Scott um, plays um, Olivia, she's younger obviously, and um, Gisette Simon, who, um, uh she's an RSC actress and you know she's just you would recognize her she's she plays Angela James's um defense lawyer and she's absolutely brilliant in that so yeah so got exciting five. times isn't it it's really exciting and I I'm really hoping you know it's brilliant it's dropping on Good Friday or Passover so people can sort of and each episode is only 40 minutes or 40, I think some might be 45 but about 40 minutes not an hour so it you know, I think sometimes when you've got an hour long episode, it can almost be a bit too long, you know, whereas mm -hmm. this is a bit more bingeable, I suppose. I'm, um, I'm expecting to see that it's at number one in the UK on my Netflix. I, I genuinely think oh, the, well, uh, we have to watch it, don't we? And do that. Tweet yeah, and everybody watch it when it comes it on Netflix because it's a phenomenal story. And even a moment ago, when you said about entitlement, hands up, like I've got friends and family that have always periodically talked to me about this and I've 
your book made me see it in a way that I'd never had before. Like, oh. there's a, I won't go into details, but there's like a restaurant scene and yeah. the behaviour of some of the characters. And I was like, God, this is what they mean when they talk to me. Because I, I, there was a part of me that never really fully got it, that people could see the world in that way. And, and I think in all your books, you, you bring characters to life. So you just you start going, oh, my word, someone could see the world so drastically different to me mm. but you bring the characters alive alive so well it's it's vivid and you you I'm like, oh my god I, I know James I know it's like I really don't want to spend time with him um but I'm well, I think very had, much looking forward to seeing him on screen well I think they had great fun filming the Oxford scenes they had they've got these young actors some of whom are sort of straight out of Bristol Vicks you know they're literally in their early 20s 22 or something and that uh, when I went on set um, the driver referred to them as the kids and they obviously had this brilliant time on Instagram you know they'll send me little stories one of them sends me has sent me stories of sort of you know bits that were being filmed and they obviously had you know these their first jobs almost for some of them were you know being on set do it being being the young versions of of, the, of, of these uh, characters James and Sophie and they obviously had a whale of a time and you know the, as you allude to the trashing up scene I, I would say though that so there's so um for anyone who hasn't read it um there's a anatomy is about a, a conservative government minister very good looking he's paid by Rupert Friend uh who's accused of raping a parliamentary researcher with whom he's had an affair in a lift in the house of commons and there's an Oxford backstory um in which James is a member of a club called the Libertines with Tom who in the present day is the prime minister and obviously the Libertines is, you know, a very thinly disguised Bullingdon club and they did various things like smash up restaurants. And um, so they obviously have great fun filming that. Um, There's a line in it where one of them, and I don't remember who it says, it might have been James, who says, well, you know, my mother always told me to be polite. And I yes, was just James like, is it, so was, it, was, it was absolutely, it floored me. That yeah. one sentence floored me because really? I was like, oh my God. God, someone it costs could... nothing to be courteous. Yes, it was something like that. And I was like, oh my goodness, you think that's courteous? <laughs> oh dear, I just where do you begin? Um, but I think uh, but I think it's I mean it's how nice the Prime Minister's to start having these parties that break the rules everywhere just to publicize my book. It's I'm very serious. it's very good, isn't it? I mean, one <laughs> of the things we've been talking a lot about, um, Peter's asked a question about, which is you always seem to be on the cutting edge of issues. Um and <laughs> <laughs> it's and things that are really you know they are yeah. important conversations about consent about you know like um what mps have to deal with about social media all these things and obviously little disasters female mental health and things like that yeah. so important these topics and he's asked how do you pick them like where does where does that come from when you go you know what, i'm gonna write about this well do you know what i people keep asking this and, and you know joking oh you got crystal ball and um i I, I don't do it cynically at all. I mean, I think I was really lucky with it to me. I think I it was partly inspired by uh, a news story, as Reputation was, um, in which was about a, or it was a column um, about a reaction to Ched Evans, a footballer who'd been granted leave to appeal against conviction for rape, and he was then actually acquitted. But it was the, 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 the judgment of, of other women cited in the column that made me think, oh, you know, ooh, we're a bit judgy, aren't we, about women in sexual offences cases. Um, and it, the entitlement came from me interviewing, and I've talked about this, um, Boris Johnson back in 2004 about his um, affair with Petronella Wyatt, um, because he had lied and he'd been sacked for lying. And by the time I interviewed him, you know, he'd already been sacked for lying, but he didn't he didn't sort of seem to think that was a massively big deal. And I was just really aware that he had a different attitude to the truth than I thought most people did totally. so actually the the and, and um sorry and um, maternal and mental health i it was something i actually experienced off my second child but i suppose when i wrote little disasters it was you know it was the sort of thing that's being talked about on women's hour and it hadn't been you know 14 years ago when i had that baby um 13 years ago um and reputation again it was a, a new story it was just me reading the papers being on twitter too much just thinking, <laughs> I liked that you changed it for a while. I'm not supposed to be on here. I uh, didn't last about two weeks. Well, I realised that then it was like earlier, it was in January and I was starting to get reviews and interest. And I thought, oh gosh, this is, 
this is probably not the time to come off social media but I have to say I'm going to have to come off it to start writing or carry on writing the next book um, mm, but that... yeah but um so I think it's just me I suppose I've been in you know I I've been a reporter or a writer for a quarter of a century um you know ever since leaving college and I listen to the new I probably listen to the news more than watch it because I think my kids particularly like at the moment they don't want to see images necessarily of what's happening in Ukraine but I've always got you know Radio 4 on um, and I've, I, I've got papers on my phone and you know BBC News on my phone so I suppose I'm just scrolling through I'm aware of what's going on um, and I think that's where my ideas come from really sorry I haven't folk, I haven't given you a very ordered answer there you said you said what did you to say you said where do it I was go? around how do you choose which one to do and it sounds to me like it just kind of comes to you something grabs your yeah, attention I think it's I sort of magpie my books are often like a couple of ideas I think Erin Kelly said that as well so um you know it was very much reading that for reputation is very much reading that article about the nine nine panic nine locks on the front door and me thinking oh my god what would it be like to live like that um and at the same time being really conscious um you know through just not necessarily my teenager but just other other parents you know what their kids have experienced just picking up really you know I think my daughter was 14 when I started writing it um she's not Flora in any way but you can't not be conscious of you know I can remember what it was like to be a teenage girl mm. you know I was bullied really badly I don't mm -hmm. think I'd have survived if social media did existed I would have taken you know it's bad enough if I see a bad tweet now you know or a, a negative Amazon review now I obsess about it so I just think at that formative age I would have just to be it's brutal yeah I would it's really brutal life. well I just wanted to finish on a question that we had um before the event which Karen wanted to know have you already started writing your next book and you just alluded to it there and I think we've got another very strong female character and there's a bit of a power control thing going on are you guessing that or are you telling no, me no I've I've I read it oh uh yeah I'm I'm uh yeah I'm very influenced by the news and it will be a bit about power as well. And then I think I will have written, I'll have written four books about judgment or power, three. Of, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll have, I'll have, well, maybe there's still more to write about. I mean, I thought it's funny. I wrote Anatomy and I, I then wrote Little Disasters because I wanted to write about another way in which women are judged. So they're judged. I think it's almost worse to be judged as a, well, I think it is worse to be bad, judged as a bad mother or a negligent mother than it is a, you know, as sort of someone who's had an affair or who's alleged rape, as, as Olivia is in Anatomy of a Scandal. So Anatomy has a professional woman, um, Kate, the barrister, who makes a judgment pressure or judgment call. And Little Disasters has Liz, the paediatrician, who's making a professional judgment call, in this case about whether a woman has harmed her baby. Um, and I, and then I came to sort of think about reputation, and I clearly had not... I clearly had more to say about politics and mm. power and judgment and control. And I also clearly wanted to write another courtroom drama because there's a murder trial at the heart of that. I think that's too much of a spoiler. Um, so I clearly had not stopped. And I think probably misogyny is the sort of overarching theme of reputation. So much as I might have thought that I'd finished writing about judgment against women, I clearly <laughs> have one very angry rant in this one. <laughs> and well no sorry controlled it's not an angry rant no it's controlled um and I think I've still got more to say about it and yeah. I think sadly there is a lot more to say about it it comes from so many yeah. different angles which your books show that what, what women have to deal with yeah I mean I haven't got a um dead I haven't killed off a woman in a book and I think you know I'm going to try really hard not to sort of do that trope of you know dead young women or you know harmed in that way um, but somebody said to me, well, why are you writing about these subjects? And I was a bit like, well, in the same way that, you know, people write about murdered women because, you know, domestic violence is so rife and, you know, three women a week or whatever are killed by partners um, in this country. Um, I suppose I'm still going to write about issues like this while they're still current. I would think this morning, perhaps I could write a co perhaps I could be the next Richard Osman because it's working quite well for him. <laughs> But unfortunately, I don't have um, an idea like that. Well, I, I think you're fantastic. I'm, I believe your Netflix series is going to be a huge hit. And we've been talking, so obviously we've got Anatomy of a Scandal. So 
Good Friday, Netflix, check it out. Um, obviously, we've touched upon Little Disasters. Oh, Again, you. another superb book um, around female mental health. And as, as Sarah mentioned there, like a doctor who knows the person, you know, what kind of call are they going to make that they know is going to have huge ramifications, which is, again, a sort of theme at the beginning of each book of like when something happens, you know, when Kate takes on that case mm. in anatomy, like those decisions that we make. And obviously... I didn't think you could just keep doing it, but you do. And there's a <laughs> reputation that just came out last week. And I, I just, you know, check them out. I'd just like to finish um, the event by thanking everyone that's joined us. We are beyond grateful for your support um, of Suffolk Libraries and our annual fundraising. If you'd like to know more about the ways that you can support us and the amazing and essential services that we provide, you can find details on our website. When this live event concludes in just a moment, you will be directed to our website where you will find a link to purchase Sarah's latest book, Reputation. So it's just come out. I highly recommend it. It's just superb. It's awesome. Do give it a read. And, you know, thanks again for coming, everybody. And Sarah, it's amazing to chat to you again. Thank you so much. Oh, lovely to chat to you.